Thank you everyone for your patience as we get that sorted out. Apparently St. Con doesn't like Max, and that's okay. Everyone's, nobody's perfect. Okay, so I am Mark from USAA. Why am I telling you I'm from USAA? Well, that's because this is the Fortune 500 company that we're gonna be talking about. And it's kind of obvious, it's on the slides, there's no use hiding it. So I'm from USAA, and so that's the company that we're gonna be talking about here. But don't worry, it's been approved through legal, so we're okay. Okay, so if you're gonna read one slide on my slide deck, this is it. So this is a, this is a quote from Sun Tzu from The Art of the War. If you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. If you know yourself, but not the enemy, for every victory gained, you will also suffer a defeat. If you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. From Sun Tzu. So this sets up what I'm gonna be talking today, which is seven lessons learned from penetration testing a Fortune 500 company. The first lesson goes along with that quote from Sun Tzu, which is, know thyself and thy networks. So when you're building a penetration testing program, you need to know what you're going after. You need to know your networks, what's exposed to the public internet. And, and so that's what we're gonna be talking about in this slide here. Okay. So first lesson, does your company know what they have exposed to the internet? Have you ever done some OSINT on yourself or your company and figured out what your public IP space is? Maybe you don't have any, or maybe you do. As an illustration of why this is important, this is a, this is a fun war story here. So, um, let me show you why this is bad. Sometimes when you don't know what's on your network, you might have some shadow IT going which is where somebody in marketing or somebody else had a great idea and they wanted to pull up a website, but they didn't let anybody in IT know, or security, right? That never happens, right? So that's what we're talking about when I say shadow IT. Now here's, here's my war story. So several years ago, I had identified a website that was run by a different team at USAA I believe it was a marketing team. Not quite sure, I don't wanna throw them under the bus because I can't remember, but it probably was marketing, so. Burp, burp. <laughs> so, oh, my mic keeps on falling off. Anyways, um, we'd found their website and we had identified that it was hosted through a third party and it was basically a Linux box exposed to the internet. Uh, port 22 was exposed. Um, all sorts of stuff was exposed. It was very vulnerable. And so we worked with the marketing people and got them to shut down this site. We just pulled it off the internet because we don't want a random uh, website that has a bunch of vulnerable things attached to it running on the internet. Well, a month or two later, we had a, um, we called it a no-notice penetration test or an outside consult consulting company come in and unbeknownst to me, they actually popped this box. They were sitting on it. They had noticed that, or uh, they had popped it through a SQL injection vulnerability, and they were sitting on the box waiting for us to log in so they could steal our creds. And then in the after action review, they're like, yeah, we were on this box, and then all of a sudden it was gone. Like, oh, we don't know what happened. And I'm like, yes, right? Win one, one for the good guys. Okay, so this one's pretty, pretty simple. This is a screen grab from greyhatwarfare.com. This is just a simple query to look for open S3 buckets. So again, this is part of knowing yourself. Do you have any S3 buckets exposed to the internet? If you do, a tool like Grey Hat Warfare could help you figure that out. So you see in this example, up in the top right, let's see. Uh, sorry, top left. Oh, my laser poisoner isn't working. Sorry. Up at the top left, you can see that I put uh, customer up there. That's all I put in. I just put in customer, and then look what the result came back. Now, this is not USAA. 
This is not anybody that I know. This is just something that I found randomly by going to greyhatwarfare.com and putting in customer. This is a dump of somebody's entire database sitting there on an open S3 bucket. Do you know if your company has any open S3 buckets? Right? You go, see where I'm going here? OK, you know and love this tool, right? It's Shodan. Shodan is a simple scanner, an internet scanner that scans the entire internet every few days and looks for interesting things. Have you ever put your company's networks in there or maybe your own private network or your domain name? In this instance, you can see that SSH is open. That might be a bad thing. It turned out that this one was false positive. SSH wasn't really open. I checked. OK, you might recognize the URL on this one. Oh, OK, people, some people got it. So if you go to saintcon.org slash admin, you are presented with this lovely WordPress admin page. So yeah, you can go there right now. Don't try to log in. That's not what I'm saying, OK? <laughs> but you can go there if you want. And I don't know if there is multi-factor authentication behind this or not. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. Maybe if I bend it this way, it'll stop falling off my face. OK. So I don't know if there's multi-factor authentication or not, but I do know that they're running a WordPress site, and so they might be susceptible to some common WordPress vulnerabilities. Again, I haven't checked because I don't have authorization. I, I'm not going to do that, and you know I am at SyncCon, so I don't want to get thrown off the stage. But do you know what your company has exposed? Are they running WordPress? I mean, something you should check, right? Okay, lesson two, know thy enemy and think like them too. Your network administrator or perhaps your boss probably thinks like the first character. Man, we got these awesome security products. We got this thing called a firewall. Ain't nobody going to break in. Yeah. So maybe they won't go through the firewall. I'm able to just send you a phishing email, right? You got to know the tactics of your enemy, and you got to be able to think like them too. So here's an example of an attack vector that you could potentially use. Does your public, um, does your public employee portal, where your employees go to when they want to work from home, does it have MFA enabled or perhaps some rate limiting on that? on that page so you can't do some credential stuffing? Well, don't worry about that. You just target a different site, maybe on, on the, still the same domain, but maybe they left a, a link controller up, you know, that precursor to um, Microsoft Teams, or maybe even Skype. Maybe they have something exposed. So you go and try to find a different portal still within their domain or website, that might have single factor auth. And if so, just do a simple password spray with your favorite month, year, and exclamation. So let's see, October 2023 exclamation. You know that's going to be a good winner somewhere. Or maybe it was from a few days ago so, or a few months ago. So you could try September or July 2023 exclamation point. So once you finally get your creds, then you go back to the actual employee authentication portal. And when you get prompted for multi-factor authentication, if they happen to be using push MFA, that is, you just kept on saying, yeah, authenticate me, authenticate me, authenticate me. And the person on the other side keeps on getting all these push messages. And maybe they're at the grocery store and they're like, man, I'm tired of getting these notifications, except, and then they're in. That is an entirely made up story. <laughs> of course, step five is, is ponage. OK, lesson three. You need to test inside your network and out. 
So this is what your boss probably thinks of your network, or, or perhaps your chief information security officer. They're like, yes, our network is the bomb. But in reality, it probably looks like this, <laughs> at least on the inside, right? Maybe you have some nice brick and mortar walls. Maybe your firewall is all that in a bag of chips. But inside, it's probably a little more squishy. You need to assume breach. What would an attacker be able to access? What if your user population clicked on that fish that you didn't want them to click on, but you know they will because we're all human? What if they clicked on that? What would they be able to see? Where would they land on your domain? So as a penetration tester, it's perfectly legal, or perhaps a red team, depending on how your organization splits it up. You can land in your user zone and just say, hey, employee clicked on a fish. I'm here. Now what can I do? Totally plausible. Something you should definitely look at. OK, so this is an interesting story. So from the user network, we were conducting a penetration test, and we found an Elasticsearch index. And we found that just by doing a simple git request on the URL and then underscore cat slash indices would produce this lovely little output that you're screen, that you're seeing to enumerate the index names. And we found that one of those indexes had a really large length, according to Burp. So we're like, hmm, all these other ones look relatively the same, but that one is like 10 times the size of the other one, so that one must be interesting. So we did some Google Foo, and we found, again, without authentication, just using um, Burp, that we could do a Git request, and then using one of the indexes from the previous slide, and then add a little search, underscore search in the URL, we found that, hey, you could dump the database. All sorts of gnarly information. But there was a problem because we found that when we did that, it only gave us 10, 10 bits of information, 10 cases, as it says there. But that's OK. We could just increase the limit to 10,000 and then pull the entire database. Now, if you really want to freak your boss out, craft them a URL, tell them, I promise this isn't a phishing email. You can click the link, it's OK, but you know, be sitting down, have a change of underwear when you click the link. Because you can send them this link, and again, without authentication from the user network, here is a dump, a ton of information that could be sensitive, all from this open Elasticsearch index. So when you, when you test inside, you need to think, OK, if I landed on the network, what would I be able to access? Would I be able to access anything without authentication? In this case, yes, because they're running an open Elasticsearch index um, that they didn't properly secure. And now my boss has brown pants. OK, so here's another one interesting. So we were doing a, a test on a closed network, and we found that the Cisco Smart Install protocol was open. I don't remember the port number, four, eight, six, seven, uh, anyways. The, Smith, the, the Cisco Smart Install protocol was enabled and online. And that's interesting because the way this protocol was developed is you install one networking switch, you bring it online, and you configure it correctly, and then you bring on its buddy, another networking switch, you bring it online, and that second network switch looks at the network for anybody running the Cisco Smart Install protocol and gets its configuration from them so that you don't have to go configure this again. Really great for installing a lot of switches and networking gear really fast, the problem is you shouldn't have that left open on your network because it gives you the entire config just by running a little script that goes and says, hey, I'm a, I'm a switch too. You should give me your configuration. So you pull that configuration, and you're like, oh, look, 
here's the MD5 encrypted password, right? So you crack that password and you then get admin on all the boxes just because somebody forgot to turn off Cisco Smart Install. So as, like I talked about, we dumped the configuration via the Cisco Smart Install protocol, cracked some passwords, and then we got full admin access on different servers. Okay, again, in a closed network, we got on the network and I was assigned a user ID. Um, my name is Mark and so my user ID was something like M Walker, Walker's my last name. And when they gave me my password that they had set for me, I noticed it was like MW, so my first and second initial, or my first initial, last initial, and then like 2019 or whatever it was, it was clearly some sort of pattern. And I thought, hmm, I wonder. So using my access, I dumped all the users, and then I said, I wonder if anybody else has that same default password, because we weren't required to change it, so why not just leave it default? Well, I found that 26 users had that little default password, and, one of the, and using those 26 user accounts, we found that on a specific box, domain users were local admin. Not problematic at all, right? Well, using that um, local admin, we pulled and cracked the passwords. Um, these weren't the real passwords. I love Geico and Fluffy Bunny. So we cracked their passwords. There were some admin passwords that I wasn't able to crack during the course of this engagement, but I was using a crappy, really limited Kali VM that didn't have any guts at all. So, you know, not too surprising. But that's okay because I could use the patch the hash technique to get admin on a few other boxes. So using those same 26 user accounts, I have found that, hey, they have a uh, GitHub repository. Well, that's interesting. What access do I have, right? So I found that I could get access to 64 projects, and in those projects there were API keys, passwords, some cloud account information. Oh, and by the way, they also had a share drive that I had access to through one of those 26 user accounts. And in that share drive, there were mobile device passwords, more passwords, and then some plain text admin creds, which turned out to be full admin on a critical server. So why am I sharing this? One, because it's fun. And then secondly, hey, what, what was the core vulnerability? It was a simple password pattern, and they weren't required to change their passwords. All the other issues that I talked about, um, domain users or local admin, the fact that they had passwords stored in their share drive and through their GitHub, those are all issues, don't get me wrong. But the reason I found them was just laziness, right? Hey, I'm gonna use the same password pattern for everyone so that if they ever forget their password, I can easily reset it for them. But, you know, a savvy attacker could do the same thing. So lesson four, get certified. Now what do I mean by that? Well, I have a story here. So I started uh, penetration testing in around 2018 at USAA, and my mentor, uh, is by the name of TJ, he had about 10 years of experience at this point. He had been uh, penetration testing for a uh, uh, outside consultant, and he'd done penetration testing at his previous employer. So he, he had a ton of experience, and he taught me the basics um, when I started penetration testing. Well, we were in a meeting with our um, PCI auditor. So PCI stands for Payment Card Industry. Yeah? Okay. And they are the folk that make sure that when you accept credit cards that your networks are good and that you're not like Target, right? Although the target was completely PCI compliant, by the way. So anyways, we were having a um, meeting with our, PS, our PCI auditor, and he asked, how are you uh, accredited, or how are you certified to, get, uh, to do this penetration test on, our P, on your PCI networks? 
Well, my friend TJ, he didn't have any certifications, and so he went on for about five, seven minutes about all the wonderful things he had done, and it was great. And then what is it, when it was my turn, I just said, hey, I have the G-Pen. And he's like, oh, okay, check. And that was it. Mine was like 30 seconds, and his was five to seven minutes, even though he had vastly more experience than I did. Because I was certified, that's what mattered. Now, do you have to get the G-Pen? No. What I'm suggesting is that you get the certification that matters to your boss. Because your boss is the one that's going to be promoting you. Your boss should hopefully know which um, certifications are useful for your auditors. In my case, it was GPEN. Um, my current boss really likes the OSCP. And the reason he likes that is, and he's not here so I can say this, he didn't pass it, but it was extremely hard and he has a ton of respect for those who get the OSCP. So for my boss, that's, that's what it was. That's what, that's what he wants. So I'm suggesting that you should get certified according to what your industry is, what your, what your auditors want, what your bosses want, and that'll get you a lot farther. OK, speaking of certifications, you don't need a certification to see what's wrong in this scenario. You laugh. But default creds are a real thing. You should uh, go check your network for some default creds, and you'll probably find some. And you'll make some admins really mad when you tell them to change the password and be like, hey, I pwned your box just by putting an admin admin. Thank you very much. OK, lesson five, build a team. So when you're just starting out uh, penetration testing your own company, it's, it might be difficult to know where to get started. Well, you don't have to, to use the industry phrase, boil the ocean all at once. Start small. Get somebody who's experienced in web app penetration testing or network penetration testing. And just do that for a little while. And then outsource what you don't know how to do yet or are not quite confident in. And then as you get more confident, you can bring in um, additional people, or as the funds magically appear, you can bring in more people who are experts in the things that you lack, like maybe web app or mobile, or whatever it is your team needs to be successful. The key thing I want you to get out of this slide is look at this person. She is seriously not engaged. So don't be like her. OK, lesson six, be curious. All right, so um, I've had the opportunity to be on, on a few interviews for new penetration testers in my field. And one of the things I try to look for, it's hard to do, but one of the things I look for is someone who has the curiosity to do penetration testing, the, the drive to dig deep. Someone who's not just satisfied with following a detailed script of you put an A in this page and then a B in this page. It's someone who is really extremely curious to know what you can do, whether or not the app was designed for that. So if you're doing a web app and you see a text field, of course you're going to throw 4,000 A's in it just to see what happens. right? And, and maybe Burp does that for you. Great. But the point is, a great penetration tester will be someone who's curious, who wants to know more, who wants to dig, dig deep. OK, so this is an interesting war story. So several years ago, my company was interested in doing voice biometrics. Now, I know things have changed since then, but this was 2018. It was several years ago. And they wanted us to test it. And so the magical phrase that you could use for this voice biometric uh, system was, as a member, my voice is my password. And so trying to fool the system, I did the very basic. I recorded myself saying, 
As a member, my voice is my password. Right. Okay, so I went through the offflow. Of course that worked. It was just a recording. It, it, of course it was going to work. So I was curious. I was like, hey, what are the upper and lower limits of this? So I started playing with it. As a member, my voice is my password. I said, what if I adjust my pitch to negative 20? I was using a tool called Audacity, and it had a, had a dial. So I changed it to negative 20. So let's listen to it again. As a member, my voice is my password. Okay, how many of you think that worked? Yeah, okay, it worked, right? It, it totally worked. So I said, okay, well, if that's not going to work, or if that does work, what if I go lower? As a member, my voice is my password. Well, what do you think? Did it work? Yeah. I can't remember if this one worked. <laughs> I was just sitting there, I was like, Wait, was that the lowest? I think it did work, now that I think about it. So I think this one, <laughs> I think this one did work. But I was curious and I was like, hey, if, if, if I could lower the pitch, what if I could raise the pitch? Maybe I was having a crazy day, would that work? As a member, my voice is my password. What do you think, did that one work? Yeah, of course it worked. So the, this next As one. As a member, my voice is my password. Right, just a little bit higher and I was like, ah, of course that works, okay. So swinging for the fences here, I was like, okay, what if I got somebody else to say it, and then I modified their pitch, that it sounded weird, just like my voice. As a member, my voice is my password. I forgot that I added white noise, so I also did that. Did that one work too? Now this is the one I was trying to set you up for. Maybe? Oh no. Okay, well, the coworker who said that is actually in this room. So imagine him saying, as a member, my voice is my password. And thankfully, it did not work. I'm sorry the slide didn't play the sound. But the reason I did this was because I was like, man, what's it going to take to get this thing to truly fail? Like, what could I do with this? And I was reminded of a movie called Sneakers. Have anybody ever seen Sneakers by the raise of hands? Great. So it is a movie that you can go check out on um, Amazon Prime if you want to, pay a few bucks to watch it. But the, the part about sneakers that I want to show you is that there was this secret, super secret vault inside a super secret building that was only accessible, accessible by voice biometrics. And it was something very similar. It said, um, my name is... Juan Gonzalez, my voice is my password, let me in. And in this movie, the way the act or the uh, story goes is the bad guys want to break in, so they hire or they have one of their female companions go on a date with the actual target. And they, she records the entire conversation, and she's trying to get him to say these words so that they can then use it later in the movie. And so she's like, you know, I would really love it if you would just say the word passport. C can you say the word passport for me? And he's like, passport? Like, whatever, whatever, woman. So after the date, they take all those words that were said throughout the entire date, they splice it together, and then this is the part of the show that is... You are clear all tips. the way up to the mantra. All right, so he's pulling out his tape recorder. He's going to play it. But he's an idiot, and he called fast forward. Denied. Hi, my name is Werner Brandis. My voice is my passport. Verify. Of course it worked. 
So I was like, hmm, I wonder if I could get the same thing to work. So I recorded myself saying some really nonsense phrase like this. Oh, no, it didn't say the nonsense phrase. Let's try this. Well, you can see the progress bar. <laughs> so imagine it said, I, I'm trying to remember exactly what it said. Um, it said some nonsense phrase like, here's looking at you. My password is something that I would never ever share with anybody else. And I had like four or five of those nonsense phrases. And then I added them all together. And let's see if this one works. If it doesn't, I'm going to be really sad. Okay, this is going to kill my presentation. So we got to see if we can play this thing. Maybe the volume's down. Let's try this again. Sigh. Okay. So afterwards, I will try to get this to work again. But let me t try my best to describe what it sounded like. So I... I did the sneaker net way, the sneakers way, and I added in all that funny, uh, I sliced all the words together, and then I added crazy things like I added some white noise from a bar, and I made the sounds really different. So it said, as a member, my voice is my password, right? And it sounded really bad because I added tons of white noise, and it was very obvious to any human who actually listened to it that this was just completely contrived. Do you think it worked? It did. It totally worked. So, I don't know if it was because of me, but we did not implement voice biometric that year. <laughs> okay, last lesson here. Build a culture of security. So this is a great slide. This is a great slide developed by one of my coworkers. If you're going to take a picture of one, this is it, because you can go back to show your boss, hey, this is what we need to do to save money. Maybe, if you want to. But the idea is that you really need to start shifting security left. Get security invested or involved early in projects so that as they're developing the code, they know to have certain security things in mind. So that when it comes to later on when you're about to de uh, deploy the code, you don't just get a uh, rushed pen test a day before they're going into production and you find all these bugs and they're like, oh crap, we got to fix this and oh, that's a systemic bug so we got to redesign the entire program. Thanks security, I hate you, right? If you can get them to let you uh, talk to them at the beginning, or if you can have trainings or other things that will help the developers be able to know the secure coding practices, you're going to save a lot of money in the, end, in the long run because they will build those uh, secure coding practices going in. So those are my seven lessons learned. Because we're all forgetful, I've summarized them for you. Lesson one, know thyself and thy networks. Lesson two, know thy enemy and think like them too. Lesson three, test inside and out. Lesson four, get certified. Lesson five, build a team. Lesson six, be curious. And lesson seven, build a culture of security. So that's what I have for our presentation. If you'd like to connect with me on LinkedIn, here's my profile. And then, of course because you know, I made fun of USA a little bit, you can always go to usajobs.com and look for opportunities in cyber. So is, are there any questions? As a USA customer, have they fixed some of the issues? <laughs> I can say that we fixed a lot of issues. That's what my team does. We find issues, we report them, and then they get fixed. Things straight. All right. Well, if there's no further questions, I'll be out in the hall if you want to talk to me later. And thank you for attending my St. Kong TED Talk. <laughs>